Hi, everyone. Hope you can all hear me. This is Deb Robertson from ALA's Public Programs Office. Welcome to today's webinar, Getting Through This Together, a community-based archival collection. I'm sorry, collaboration. Today's webinar is presented by the ALA's Public Programs Office with funding provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the CARES Act Economic Stabilization Plan. Hopefully many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars like this one. A couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have the microphone access, but you're welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. To send a chat message, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click chat. Please note the chat defaults to sending only to all panelists. To make sure everyone can see that your message, be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down box next to the two field in chat. If you have technical issues, please use the Q&A window to communicate with the ALA staff. To send a message to the Q&A feature, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on Q&A. Please try not to put technical questions in the chat window because they could be missed over there. So now I would like to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. Sarah Allison is the Head of Archives User Engagement at Ball State University Libraries, Archives, and Special Collections. She is committed to providing access, preservation, and promotion of primary and rare materials and exploring the educational value archivists and librarians provide for undergraduate and graduate students in the area of primary archival research. Sarah McKinley is the local history and genealogy, genealogy supervisor at Muncie Public Library and manager of the beautiful historic Carnegie Library. A seventh generation to hail from Delaware County and a third generation employee of the library, Sarah has a passion for librarianship, local historical research, and education. She also serves on the board of directors of the Delaware County Historical Society. James Connolly is a George and Francis Ball Distinguished Professor of History, Director of the Center for Middletown Studies, and Co-Director of the Digital Scholarship Lab at Ball State University. He has worked on a variety of digital projects involving the production of research databases, virtual spaces, and the use of computational text analysis. Along with Patrick Collier, he co-directs the Everyday Life in Middletown project. Patrick Collier is the professor and chairperson of English at Ball State and the director of Everyday Life in Middletown project. He's also co-editor of the Journal of Modern Periodical Studies. Everyday Life in Middletown began with a class he led at the Virginia B. Ball Center for Collaborative Inquiry in 2016. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Sarah Allison. Thank you. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Document Your Story COVID-19 Pandemic Project Archive is a community-based archival collaboration between three separate organizations, Ball State University Libraries, Muncie Public Library, and the Everyday Life in Middletown Project. In this presentation, we will talk about the development of this community-based project, provide examples of the different practices and platforms each organization has been using to collect content, and share some examples of the type of material our community has created. Slide, please. Uh, so first, I want to give you a little background information. Ball State is a public research academic university with over 20,000 undergraduate and graduate students. Ball State University Libraries, Archives and Special Collections acquires, preserves, and provides access to rare and unique resources that support the research and instructional needs of students, faculty, and the general public. Much like any other archive, we have a wonderful teaching collection of university and local history. We provide roughly 80 instruction sessions a year and work closely with a wide, wide, wide range of faculty from history and English to graphic and studio art. 
Ball State has a robust immersive learning program where undergraduate students go into the local community and work on a project. Archives and Special Collections has worked closely with a number of these courses and many of the final projects are included in our digital media repository. Slide please. Document Your Story COVID-19 Project Archive came, to get, came together in many different ways. In March, two weeks before the shutdown, I met with a faculty member to discuss the use of a scrapbook about the smallpox epidemic in Muncie and Delaware County in 1893. The Dr. Hugh Cowing scrapbook is a wonderful resource of local newspaper clippings. It is a great instructional item that is used in our Intro to Archives courses. It, it really is a portal to a different time and is specific to the local history of our city. When the university moved to online instruction in the middle of March, the campus population significantly decreased. Our archival processing assistant mentioned that she started taking photographs on her way into the office just to document the change on campus. As we began to navigate the rest of the spring semester, I started thinking about the role that archives have in documenting social change. Other institutions, including the Indiana Historical Society, we're creating online submission forms for people to submit and document their experience. My thoughts turned back to the Cowing scrapbook and how much we used it in our instruction sessions. The scrapbook consisted of newspaper clippings compiled by a local doctor and provided a small but important window into Muncie and Delaware County during the smallpox epidemic. While this information is valuable, we have limited firsthand accounts. I started asking myself, how could we do this? How do we get the community to start documenting now? Next slide. As the archives move forward with this project, I wanted to reach out to every member of our community who may be interested in documenting their story. I started to think about the type of material to include. Archives traditionally collect correspondence, diaries, journals, and photographs in analog form. We couldn't collect physical material in the middle of a pandemic, and do the members of our community still create physical content? Since I started at Ball State in 2018, I have continued to build upon relationships between the university libraries and the community of Muncie and Delaware County. For this project, I thought casting a wider net was needed, and the best way was collaborating, collaborating with similar organizations and projects in the area. I reached out to Sarah McKinley at the Muncie Public Library and Jim Connolly and Patrick Collier with the Everyday Life in Middletown project. Slide please. After a phone, phone call and an email conversation, everyone was on board to start the Document Your Story COVID-19 Pandemic Archive project. From there, we worked on the text for a website, a press release, and a submission form. For the Ball State University Libraries part, I worked in our IT department to develop a submission form through the SpringShare product LibWizard. The text and required questions on the form were vetted through the university's general counsel's office and included questions about copyright permission and permission to include the content in the digital collection and exhibit. For the press release, we worked on the language and it was vetted through library administration and sent through university marketing and communications. Once the forum and website were live, I reached out to the departments on campus, asking them to promote the project to their students, faculty, and staff. Slide, please. Over the course of this project, Ball State received questions about autonomy in submitting content to the collection. This opened up a conversation about members of our community who wanted an outlet to express their feelings and experiences who may have concerns about being identified. We understood the need for some form of, auto of autonomy and we certainly didn't want that to become a barrier for anyone who wanted to express their voice. This came up when working with a faculty member on a final essay project related to COVID-19 and an English course on queer literature. Many of the students self-identified as LGBTQ plus and wanted some form of autonomy. The faculty member submitted a single document where students were not identified and the faculty member provided an opening essay about the course and the final project. Additionally, the faculty member expressed that the students were very thankful for a chance to make their voices heard and recognized by future historians and scholars. After working with this faculty member, we decided to update the form to include two additional yes or no questions. 
one, the option to remain anonymous, and the second asking if the submitter would like an embargo period on their submission. This way, if there were community members, including students, who wanted to submit their story but had some reservations about being identified or wished for an embargo, the option was available. As promotion for the project continued, we received questions and comments about collecting records from local nonprofit organizations in the community. We realized that while we wanted to collect individual stories, there are university records, city records, and organizational records that are important to collect. We worked with local organizations and businesses like the Ball Brothers Foundation and First Merchants Bank to collect material around their efforts to support members of the community during COVID. Additionally, we have been actively web archiving the university's website and all COVID-19 updates. Slide please. After six months of working on this project, we have created the COVID-19 archive repository. This repository includes the document your story submissions along with student projects, local community records, and university records. The project has developed into more than just individual stories from our community. Ball State has received material ranging from photographs, organizational records, and journal entries. Here are a few examples. We have received 42 individual submissions from community members, Ball State students, and university departments. This includes Ball State University Marketing and Communications and the Ball State Nursing Program. Additionally, the archives includes content from three undergraduate courses and three local community organizations and businesses. In total, the archive currently has over 950 individual items that document our community during this time. While we continue to collect submissions and promote the archive, other collaborative projects have spurred out of this project. We continue to develop new relationships with faculty on campus and, and collect student projects related to COVID-19. This past month, we began a conversation with an art faculty member regarding the inclusion of digital student artwork created during this semester. While the artwork may be COVID-19 related this semester and added to the COVID-19 archive, this assignment is a requirement for the major. In a post-COVID world, developing this relationship will allow archives and special collections to continue to preserve student projects. And now I'm gonna send it over to Sarah McKinley. All right, thank you, Sarah. So I'm the other Sarah, Sarah McKinley. Um, I am from the Muncie Public Library, the local history and genealogy supervisor there. Um, as Sarah Allison mentioned, um, if it wasn't clear in the beginning, we have three different organizations or archives who are partnering in promoting this project or initiative, but each of us is using our own unique platforms to collect information. And then when completed, we will create a web portal to link all of our organization's projects together. So I will be covering how Muncie Public Library is collecting items. And first, I'd like to introduce you to our organization and our archive. So I manage the historic Carnegie Library in downtown Muncie, Indiana, which is an entire public library branch dedicated solely to local history and genealogy archives and services, services focusing on Delaware County and East Central Indiana. Next slide. We are unique in that not only are we a public library branch dedicated to local history and genealogy, but we also have a partnership with the local county government and clerk's office to house their thousands of original marriage books, court documents, deeds, wills, and other historical county records. We have also been digitizing these records for almost 25 years now, and we provide free access in our digital resource library. Muncie Public Library has also partnered with the Ball State Archives and Center for Middletown Studies on numerous projects involving historical library collections, as well as collaborating on many successful educational outreach programs to share our collective knowledge and reach broader audiences within our community. So when our library staff were sent home at the beginning of the pandemic in March, and Sarah Allison contacted me with her idea for this project, I was immediately on board. This was something that we could start on right away, even while we were working remotely, uh, by creating our plans, our digital submission forms, our press releases, and so on. Next slide. 
So just last year, our library began subscribing to a digital platform that's new to us called Biblioboard. If you're not familiar with Biblioboard, it's marketed as a community engagement tool for libraries that allows you to create, share, and discover. One of the main tools that my department utilizes is called Creator. Unlike our existing digital resource library, which is strictly a documents database, Creator allows us to upload a variety of media, including photos, video, audio, and eBooks, and then curate those items in our own custom anthologies and collections. Before things shut down for COVID, I had recently uploaded a collection of our school yearbooks, which was perfect timing because that gave our patrons something to have fun browsing and sharing while they were at home. We also had begun using the platform to add community and family history collections. Next slide. So I knew I wanted some sort of web form to allow patrons to submit their content to us the same way that Ball State would be using LibWizard for their submissions. And our website has a web form feature that allows digital submissions. However, there is already a custom submissions page feature in Biblioboard that's integrated with that creator tool that we use. I had been planning some other community and oral history projects for which I wanted to use the custom submissions pages, but the pandemic had interrupted those plans. So this was the perfect time for us to give it a try. Next slide. This feature allows us to invite patrons to share their content directly with us to add to our library's community collections. All that I needed to do was provide our branding, our project information, our terms, the formats that we would accept, and so on. And then Biblioboard creates the custom submissions page. So this is the page with information about the project and the link to submit items to the archive including information on how to submit items in analog form. Next slide. The legal agreement is already built in as the first step in the submissions process, which is very simple to navigate, and the content is submitted directly to the Biblioboard system. Like our partners, we wanted the format of the submissions to be as open-ended as possible to allow for creativity and freedom of expression. Therefore, we allowed audio, video, photography, art, diaries, poetry, books, podcasts, posters, postcards, and so on. If someone is unable to submit their content digitally, we also left the option open for the patron to contact us directly to make arrangements to either donate a physical item or allow us to help them digitize the item in whatever phase of reopening that we felt was appropriate for that. So far, all of our submissions have been digital, but we do have that option open. Next slide. Once new content is submitted through the web form, we receive an email notification from Biblioboard. We can then log into our creator tool to review the submission, edit the metada metadata, and add it to our custom collections. Next slide. So this is what the collection then looks like in our digital archive on the website. So far, we have found that the majority of submissions for this project have come through the submissions either to the Ball State Archives or the Everyday Life in Middletown project. Um, class assignments have helped with this, as well as um, diarists who are already part of the Everyday Life in Middletown project, which Jim and Pat will talk about next. Um, the general public or off-campus community have been a little slower to respond to Muncie Public Library's uh, call for submissions, um, but this shouldn't be discouraging if you're working on a project like this. Um, many of our patrons are still in the middle of a pandemic and may not be ready to share their thoughts and feelings yet, so that's why those prompts for these projects may help with that uh, barrier. Um, many of us are still figuring out how to pay the rent or help our children attend school virtually. So um, many people will likely wait until the pandemic is over to feel like they can really reflect on what's happened. Um, but that's also why we didn't set a deadline for submissions. We'll continue to actively collect materials that are created both during and later in reflection of the pandemic. Next slide. So in terms of the type of content that we've received so far, all of our submissions to Muncie Public Library have been either photographs or artwork. These are two of my favorite examples so far. 
The photograph on the left was submitted by a parent who said that her daughter's teacher had set up a safe place to hug her students without actual physical contact. So you can see she has the plastic contraption on her front door that she's made that they can put their arms through and hug through the plastic. The sign on the left says quarantine hugs with Senora Pave, disinfect all surfaces and let them dry, arms in the bottom holes and hug, and again, disinfect all surfaces. The watercolor painting on the right is titled On This Side of the Window and was painted by Lori A. Riccardi. She painted it on April 8th when her daughter was home from school. Um, and it's a watercolor portrait of her daughter Annie reading a book during the pandemic. Next slide. Um, as Sarah Allison also mentioned, another result of this project is collaboration not only um, in our community, but also within our own organizations. So as a multi-branch library system here at Muncie Public Library, we noticed during the pandemic when we began offering virtual programs online that our programs became less branch specific or department specific and have truly become more of a collaboration between departments and branches. It was the same with this project. Our adult services department, for example, had been toying with the idea of a community cookbook before the pandemic. And since we launched the Document Your Story uh, project, they adapted their idea into Document Your Eats Quarantine Cuisine. So as a component of the pandemic project archive, we are now also asking specifically for the community to submit recipes of things that they have been cooking during the pandemic. These recipes will be compiled into a digital cookbook that will become part of the pandemic project archive collection. Next slide. So the final thought that I wanted to share about our part of the project is don't forget to document what your own library or organization is going through. When our library staff began returning to our offices in May, I immediately requested that all departments begin documenting how life has changed at the library. Both before and after our customers returned, I asked them to look around and photograph how we have had to change our routine to adapt to the pandemic. Temperature check stations, socially distancing our departments and our computers, wearing masks, 3D printing face shields for the community, new signage, plexiglass screens at our help desks, contactless curbside delivery, these are all things that many of our organizations may have never seen before and may never see again. So that needed to be included in our archive as well. So with that, I will turn things over to Jim and Pat to talk about the Everyday Life in Middletown Studies Diary Project. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. And thanks also to uh, the ALA for organizing this event uh, and having us. Uh, as you heard, I'm the director of the, the Center for Middletown Studies uh, here at Ball State, and I'm also part of the team that runs the Everyday Life in Middletown project, along with Pat Collier. Uh, you'll hear from him in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the background for the project, uh, and then Pat's going to weigh in with some thoughts about some of the things we've learned from the work we've done in relation to the, the pandemic. Um, can you advance the slide, please? Before I get going on the project itself, I wanted to just explain what we mean when we use the word Middletown. Uh, we're referring to Muncie, Indiana, uh, which is the city where Ball State University is located. Uh, and more importantly for our purposes, it's also the city that was a subject of a famous sociological study that was undertaken during the 1920s by Robert and Helen Lind, whom you see pictured uh, in the lower right of the screen there. Uh, they were commissioned by the Rockefeller Foundation to come to this city, city and study the impact of industrialization on American life. Uh, and so they came during the mid 1920s, did their work and then completed a book that was eventually titled Middletown, A Study in Modern American Culture, which was published in 1929. And this proved to be an enormously successful and influential book. Uh, it was a bestseller at the time. It attracted a lot of attention and comment. Uh, and it's considered one of the most uh, influential observations of American life in, in the 20th century. And since it was such a success, the publisher commissioned a sequel. Uh, the Lins were asked to go back and study Muncie again during the 1930s to assess the impact of the depression. 
they completed another book, Middletown in Transition, which was published in 1937. And what this did was set up a tradition of coming to Muncie to make sense of broader social and cultural trends in the United States. And so scholars, journalists, uh, other, other uh, investigators have come back to, to Muncie at various points over the course of the 20th and now the 21st century uh, and restudied the community. Uh, so there's this long tradition of using Muncie as a kind of microcosm for broader trends and developments in, in American life. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Uh, so the Center for Middletown Studies uh, is in charge of supporting and promoting research that builds on this existing body of scholarship uh, on Muncie as, as Middletown. And the Everyday Life in Middletown project is one of those initiatives. Uh, it's a collaboration, as you see here, uh, between the citizens of, of Muncie and Ball State faculty and students. This, the, the project originated, as you've heard, in a, a student-driven project that, that Pat Collier headed up. And it's remained an, a, a project that the, the center has been supporting for several years. And the goal here is to produce an archive of ordinary experiences in, in Muncie. Uh, mostly what we do is collect anonymous day diaries. These are written accounts of specified days. We send out a notice to all of our participants that we're going to have a diary day, say next Thursday, and then everyone spends that day recording everything that they do, that they think, that they feel that they can manage to get down on paper. And so this is the chief way in which we document daily experiences, but we also collect uh, responses to open-ended questionnaires. Uh, we encourage people to submit other kinds of multimedia material. So there's a whole variety of things uh, that we collect in what we think of as a digital commons. And part of the idea here is to create a online archive, a visible archive that documents these everyday experiences and makes them visible in ways where people can recognize things they have in common. Uh, you know, we all brush our teeth, we all commute, we all, not well, many of us commute, maybe we used to commute, uh, we all daydream, uh, we all do a variety of things that, that we have in common. And so even while we're divided by politics and culture so much right now, there are common experiences that cut across those divisions. And part of what we hope to do with this project is to make some of those common experiences uh, a little bit more visible. So can you advance the slide, please? So just to give you a little sense of where we got the idea for the project, we've, we've drawn on two particular models. The most important of these is, is the Mass Observation Project, which has been going on in England since the 1930s. And it was an effort by a group of academics and, and artists to pay closer attention to what was going on in, in daily life. They did that through collecting diaries. That's one of their techniques that, that we have borrowed. They sent out these questionnaires uh, and they uh, collected evidence of ordinary life in, in other ways as well. Interestingly enough, uh, one of their inspirations for this work was the original Middletown study by the Linz. And of course, that's a model for us as well. The work that the Linz produced, the, the big book that they published in 1929, was filled with observations about ordinary experiences, the rhythms of factory work, the impact of new appliances on domestic life, the importance of radio and other forms of entertainment that were emerging in the 1920s. So the, the mass observation people saw what the Linz had done and they were trying to get at some of that same information. And so part of what we hope we're doing by sort of bringing the techniques of mass observation to the study of Muncie is to close that circle a little bit and, and more closely connect Middletown research with mass observation and, and projects that focus on everyday life. There's also a lot of theory behind this and I'm not gonna go into that in any great detail uh, at this point, given the time allowed. Uh, but the important takeaway is, is to understand that our daily routines are the places where the deepest and biggest changes that take place in our society and culture register themselves, become visible. But they only become visible if you pay attention to them. And part of what we're doing is we're prompting people to take notice of the passing feeling, the emotions that, that occur during the day, the, the, the things you do that you don't think about. Um, those routine things like brushing your teeth and commuting and eating uh, and so forth and, and, and reflect on those a little bit and record some of what, what, what you notice. A big part of what we're trying to do is to pry people's attention away from the event 
uh, and instead pay more attention to the everyday. There's this distinction in scholarship about everyday life between the everyday uh, and the event. The event is the stuff that makes headlines in the newspapers. The everyday is uh, a more ordinary set of experiences uh, that, that matter particularly to, uh, to, to people's lives. Uh, and so we hope what we're doing is collecting evidence of all kinds of experiences that otherwise wouldn't have been noticed. Uh, as I said, this project began as a student project in 2016 under Pat's direction. Uh, the Center for Middletown Studies has continued to support it uh, since then. And up to this point, we've collected a little over 300 of these day diaries I was describing, uh, as well as a series of responses to various kinds of questions and questionnaires. Uh, we've had our participants contribute various essays. We've collected some multimedia material, all of which is uh, available through our website. Uh, we also have a blog feature on the site, uh, and there we use the, the blog to comment on what we're seeing, what we're, what we're learning from some of the material we're collected. And we're trying to be democratic about this and making sure that the blog includes not just the observations of the scholars that are involved in the project, but also making it a forum for the participants, the volunteers, to have their say about what they see and have their say about the direction uh, and the character uh, of the project. So that's a, that's a key part of what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage with the community and have them be involved in, in, a, in a meaningful way. So could advance the slide, please. And part of how we're, tr we're trying to engage with people is to make sure that the material we collect is accessible. Our archive is big or getting big and growing. Uh, it's, it's increasingly varied. So we're trying to create tools and resources that allow people to come into it and to make sense of this growing body of material more readily. So one of the things we've done on an experimental basis is create a data visualization tool that allows people to look at what are some of the linguistic patterns that are occurring in the diaries and other material that we're collecting. So they can go in and see what's going on in a little bit different way that doesn't require them to read from end to end 300 plus diaries and, and other material. We've also set up a tagging system, as you see on the right here, that gives people a chance to sort through this growing mass of, of, of information and to dive into particular topics. So if they come here looking for something specific, what people are dreaming or cooking or the weather or whatever, whatever it might be, they'll have a way into the material where they can select out entries that touch on, uh, on those topics uh, and make sense of it. So these are a couple of examples of the ways that we hope that we're making this material accessible to users uh, in various ways. One of the things we learned over the course of the, uh, the early stages of the project is that, it, is that we wanted to make sure that it was accessible to people on various platforms and various devices, uh, their phones as well as their, their laptops and desktops. And we learned from our participants, we, we sat down and discussed this with them, did a little bit of a, a sort of a user experience analysis, is that the platform we were originally using with the content management system, Omeka, wasn't particularly suitable for them. They didn't find it easy to use, especially when they were using a phone or a tablet. So we switched over and began to use WordPress as the primary platform for the project. Uh, and that proved to be a little more accessible, a little, more, a little bit more flexible for our needs, especially the blog feature. Uh, that it contains. So it's enabled us to engage with the community uh, a little bit more effectively. Uh, and, and so that's sort of uh, where the project is. When the pandemic came along, one of the things we felt we were well positioned to do was to make sense of what, is, what was changing from before the pandemic to during the pandemic in terms of people's everyday lives and, and their ordinary experiences. Uh, and so that's one of the contributions I think we're making. It's one of the ways that, that the Everyday Life Project can contribute to the, the larger effort that the two Sarahs uh, and their two libraries are involved in. And one of the ways I hope we're complementing uh, what they're doing. So up to over the course of the pandemic, we've had two diary days, two sets of diaries collected now. Uh, we have sent out a questionnaire ask, asking people to reflect on their experiences and, and prompted some of our contributors to write up uh, some other thoughts uh, about the diary. We hope to continue to do this as the, the pandemic continues to unfold. So to talk a bit more about what we learned, I'm gonna pass it on now to Pat and he's gonna dig into some of this material in more detail. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Jim. Um, 
Um, so yeah, I would like to, uh, and thanks also to uh, the Sarahs for reaching out to us and getting this going. Um, and also to the folks at Programming Librarian, uh, Deb and Samantha, uh, for their work in uh, getting this event together. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what particularly I think our project brings to the table in this collaboration with the Muncie Library and the Ball State Library archives uh, specifically. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the, th the initial sort of patterns that we're sort of seeing in the material that we've collected about the pandemic. Um, we, um, we're different from, uh, we, we sort of stand out in this set of three uh, co uh, connected projects in that we're working with a pre-existing set of volunteers that we have relationships with that, is, that span back three or four years in some cases. We have this cohort of volunteers that we've been developing and working with over the years. And, and um, not only do we have that pre-existing relationship, but we've also been sort of prompting them to think about everyday life in specific ways. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking a little bit here about the ways in which our project is especially uh, apt at capturing ordinary activities, the kinds of things that are not the event that uh, Jim was talking about, uh, the sort of sense that like the things that usually don't get recorded, our project is actually sort of set up to record those things. Um, and specifically the way that our project is good at capturing passing thoughts and emotions. Um, and so if you would uh, hit the next slide, please. Um, so, um, close attention to ordinary activities. Um, from the beginning, um, when we get a new volunteer, we prompt them to, to pay closer attention to, to their everyday lives than they normally would. As Jim um, sort of uh, referenced before, uh, the Everyday Life in Middletown project's fundamental uh, precept is that there's meaning and significance in everyday activities. Um, and so our volunteers are aware of this. We communicate with our volunteers a good deal. We, I email our volunteers, you know, at least a couple times a month, usually more. Um, we've also had focus groups um, and other ways of sort of um, getting feedback from our volunteers. And so um, our volunteers use our activities, the diaries and the questionnaires, to pay close attention to their ordinary lives. Um, if you'd hit the next slide. Um, here are some examples from our pandemic specific documents. So as Jim said, the two diary days that fell during the pandemic um, and a questionnaire that actually asked people to expand at some length on their experience of the pandemic. So first we have someone noting the sting of hand sanitizer um, and the chapping of hands from excessive washing, or sorry, I should say, uh, you know, extra washing. Um, a second um, quote about um, basically the Zoom life, the, the life of being at your home desk uh, for many hours a day. Um, and third, I think a really insightful one, quote, I'm still teleworking and not quite used to it. Getting up to take a break, break means that I'm suddenly and actually at home, but then I return to work and things change. Now this is of course a very, very ordinary event, but it is also strange because of the change that we've all been through, right? The notion that at work you take a break and you find yourself at home, and then you have to shift into that work mode again uh, quickly. So these are some examples of the kinds of attention to ordinary activities that our diarists and volunteers register. Uh, next slide, please. Um, thoughts and emotions. Um, there's, there are two factors here that, that I think make our instruments good for registering emotion and passing thought. Um, one is the diary uh, genre itself. Um, of course, people know what a diary is, and the diary has a long tradition in Western culture. Um, and among the, the diary's uh, conventions is the sort of confessional uh, mode in which you share emotions, right? You share thoughts and emotions. That's really the main reason why people write diaries if they write diaries at all. Um, and so the, the genre itself um, lends itself to the expression, ex expression of thoughts and emotion. Um, in addition to that, we have a very general prompt that we give our uh, volunteers and I send it out to them every time we do a diary. Um, and that prompt is this very brief statement in the middle of the slide. Write down what you do and what you're thinking and feeling as you do it. I mean, I can't, uh, we can't take credit for having thought very hard about that, um, but it does turn out in, in actuality that it really does prompt people to record feeling a lot, actually. Um, so if you would hit the next slide. 
um, a couple examples of the sorts of passing thoughts and emotions that our diarists were registering in our pandemic uh, artifacts. Um, and so uh, first one, quote, I'm feeling dissociative for lack of a better word, just that sort of surreal feeling that creeps in at night with everything. Like my wife barely seems like a real person and not a figment of my imagination. Everything is entirely normal on the micro level with this underlying surreal quality. So I think you can see here how our prompt, which asks people to pay attention to their emotions, actually is getting sort of really nuanced uh, a recording, a registering of a sort of pretty uh, subtle emotional state. Um, the second quote there uh, talks about a shift in the emotional landscape in the middle of a, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the writer the writer here is on a Zoom call with some friends uh, at a distant place, um, and how the mood shifts when a little conflict comes up about whether the the person is going to be able to go to their wedding. Right? There's a little bit of conflict here about whether or not it's okay to be out in a public space. Um, and the third one there, you know, is a little bit more straightforward, but still, I think, pretty profound. Um, somebody registering the fact that they haven't been exercising and that inertia has set in um, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, I want to move on from those two major themes, um, um, sort of close attention to ordinary activities and recording of themes and emotions, and talk to you briefly about what we've seen in reviewing the, um, the COVID-specific um, documents that we've collected. And there's four categories here. Adaptations, the ways people are adapting their lives to the new, the quote-unquote new normal. Um, gratitude, um, a lot of expressions of gratitude in the midst of um, sort of uh, expressions of angst or discomfort, uh, grooming, uh, and, you know, on the topic of ordinary activities, nothing's more ordinary than grooming, but the pandemic is having an effect on, on it. Um, and finally, weather, um, which again, nothing's more every day than weather, every day has weather. Um, and yet, um, weather seems to have taken on more importance to people, given the, um, the realities of lockdown and quarantine, um, etc. Next slide, please. So a couple examples of adaptations we've seen from our volunteers. Uh, the, in the first case, uh, uh, the a ritual that is born out of going out to work continues at the home. Um, the writer continues to give her, uh, her wife a uh, go to work hug in spite of the fact that neither of them is leaving the house. Um, uh, a kind of a lyrical uh, little moment in the second quote there, where uh, this writer notes that um, he's finding, quote, a renewed focus on small things around the house. I'm looking at nature more, finding quiet moments and appreciating that. If not for the horrific reasons why I'm home, this would be beautiful. And this is really, a, really characteristic of the sorts of emotional uh, realities that our um, volunteers record. And then finally, coffee in bed. This is, and we've seen many, many examples of this sort of thing. Um, new adaptations that people have come up with um, that they're liking and that they're hoping they can keep with uh, once we go back to normal. Um, coffee in bed, this is my favorite part of the new routine. Every day we spend the first hour of the day sitting in bed, playing with the boys, drinking coffee. It really is the best way to start a day. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, gratitude is a topic that Jim and I have talked about before, and I feel like we need to write something about. Um, the, there is a sort of gospel of gratitude in the self-help world and the self-help discourse of America um, in the, at this time. It certainly predates the pandemic, but I've been sure that you know that, you know, you can buy gratitude journals and there's this uh, really um, popular saw at this point about practicing gratitude as a mental health strategy. Um, and this has been showing up in the diaries really consistently from the beginning over the last three or four years. But it takes on a particular pandemic form in some of the things that we've been seeing. And so, uh, you know, we, and I think this is both the first episode incident, uh, the first um, example there is both an episode of gratitude and of adaptation where somebody um, has started a silver lining list uh, for the pandemic, uh, for the pandemic, uh, you know, noticing things that the pandemic has made better or has made visible or has made uh, sort of us more conscious of. Um, gratitude for being employed, um, very common across these diaries. Um, um, and finally, quote, we are grateful to do what we can to stop COVID. Next slide. Uh, and just a couple last things here. Um, 
Um, I mean, you'll find this amusing and I think probably, um, you know, probably will hit home with you the notion that our, uh, our grooming patterns have changed a little bit. Um, uh, oh, first of all, we have weather. With our stay at home orders, the weather affects my mood more than usual. This is a very strong trope among the diaries. Um, second one, almost every day, the first thing I do is check the weather. Sun and warmth make our lockdown days tolerable. Rain and gloom leaves me feeling a bit trapped. Um, you know, I, interestingly enough, I read the uh, book by Albert Camus called The Plague um, in the early days of the pandemic. And this is a, something that his narrator notes, writing about a fictional plague set in the early 20th century. Um, but one of the things he notes is that the weather just seems really important now because it really, ch it really changes your day drastically when you're stuck inside um, versus being able to go outside. Um, and then the grooming stuff, which, you know, this is predictable. I don't think you'll, any of you will find this stuff surprising, but uh, wearing yoga pants all day, putting on something besides sweats, um, et cetera. Next slide. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, and so now we're ready to take some questions and I'll invite the rest of the presenters to uh, come back online. And um, So kind of real quick though, I wanna kind of bring it all back together. Um, as we've been working on this initiative, we have come to see this project as a digital community archive between Ball State University Libraries Archives and Special Collections, Everyday Life in Middletown Project, and Muncie Public Library. Since the majority of the content we have received is digital, we can link everything together through our digital platforms. For example, Ball State will be building a digital collections uh, accessible through our digital media repository. On the collection landing page, we will discuss the community project and bring it all together by including links to Everyday Life in Middletown Project and Muncie Public Library. Additionally, our collections database archive space will be able to link related materials together. With this platform, we can digitally link all three archives. Collaborating with Sarah McKinley, Jim Connolly, and Pat Collier has brought community stakeholders together to build this digital community archive in the hopes of including as many audiences and groups as possible. The content collected by the Muncie Public Library and the Everyday Life in Middletown Project is currently available and the direct links will be shared with the participants. The next step in our collaboration is to think of ways to use the content we have received in different research capacities. We also plan to explore ways to use this digital community archive as a platform for community research, lecture series, and student research projects. We would like to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. And as Pat said, we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to Sarah and Sarah and James and Patrick. And we do have about 10 minutes left. So we're ready to take some of your questions. Go ahead and put those in the chat box now. I do see a first question already. In your diary entries, have you seen an increased focus on pets? That is a, a great and somewhat hilarious question um, because we have seen an extreme emphasis on pets from the very beginning. It's, uh, it, it's just, I mean, I think Jim will bear me out on this. It's just been really striking uh, how much people write about their pets. And pets really are tied up with everyday life. They're part of the routine. Um, I mean, I would say 10% of our, 10, 10 to 20% of our diaries, they typically go through the day in chronological order and they tend to start with pets, right? The cat woke me up, the dog woke me up, it was time to walk the dog. Now, the question about whether we've seen an increased focus, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. It's hard to imagine it increasing, honestly. Yeah, we have tags already, to, you know, stuff from even beforehand where we had tons of references to pets. So uh, I would say that they've sustained that, that level. I'm not sure it's increased. Mm -hmm. Another question, what is your plan for after COVID is over? Uh, is that directed at any particular part of the project? I mean, we're an ongoing project, so our, our intent is to continue. So we're, we hope to have material collected from before, during, and after. And so we'll be able to assess what things stick, what changes really continue in terms of everyday life, uh, and which ones fade or, or return to normal or, or evolve into something entirely new. So uh, hopefully that'll be soon that we can move into the over phase. Mm -hmm. 
I think for um, for the Ball State Archives, we'll still continue to collect material. Like Sarah McKinley said, you know, some people may not be thinking about wanting to submit anything right now because there's so much going on, but they may collect material as this time goes on and we'll want somewhere to put it. So I think we'll still look to um, provide some form of collection development after it's over. Okay, the next question is, uh, do you include personal home YouTube videos? So for ours, we have received some video submissions. They've had to send it to us directly because unfortunately our, our submission form can only hold um, a certain amount of uh, data. Um, so we do have some, most of them are from the student projects that we received, but if anyone was interested in, in submitting a video, we would add it to the archive. Yeah, we haven't received any video at Muncie Public Library yet either, but our platform does allow for people to submit videos through the submission page. We've invited our diarists to um, submit um, to submit um, video diaries or audio diaries, and no one at this point has taken us up on it. We have some other questions from the Q&A area. Have you found any issues with using multiple platforms between the different part participating institutions? Not that I don't I think, think so. No. No. Ultimately, we're each on our own and then we link to each other and point users from one to the other. So we don't need to have a, a substantial platform. There is going to be a landing page, I think, that Ball State University Libraries will build. Uh, and that will be a portal into all three projects, but then all three projects will exist independently on the web. So, so there won't be any digital link between all three archives, but the landing page will sort of direct you to those. Correct. Yes. That's kind of the plan for right now. So here's a question. Is the archive meant only for people in Indiana or your geographic area or from around the U.S. or would you accept international submissions? So we have received, because it's a, a publicly accessible online submission form, we have received uh, submissions from people who are not part of Delaware County or the Muncie area. And we have added them to the archive because they've submitted it and it is, you know, a worldwide event. Um, we don't solicit those kinds of donations, but but since the form is public and anyone can submit, we, we would add it to the archive. We have parameters for our participants because it is a study of monthly. Um, and so basically we invite people who um, either live or work in Muncie um, to, you know, to take part in ours. Are there submissions you had to refuse? And if so, for what reason? The only example that I have for mine so far is um, we do state on our submission form that we're asking for items that are specifically on this topic. And we had one submission that wasn't related to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the purpose of our archives. So we didn't include it in our um, end product. Uh, Ball State hasn't, we haven't received anything that we've had to refuse. At Everyday Life in Middletown, we, um, our diarists are anonymous. Um, we actually identify them by um, uh, diarist numbers that we give them. And uh, we, we prompt that, because it's a relatively small place, Muncie's a city of about 70,000. Um, and our participants are mainly sort of, you know, professional middle class people. Um, and so, um, we make them aware that what they record may make, may make it clear to anyone who reads them who they are. Like if they're talking about where they work or organizations they volunteer for or anything like that. Um, we actually have them sign a disclaimer um, that makes it clear that it's up to them how much they reveal. Um, uh, however, uh, we, do have, we do read and edit the diaries before we put them up, just in case someone says anything libelous, um, potentially libelous about a coworker or something like that. And so in probably, maybe a dozen or so cases, we have asked our diarists if we could make slight edits 
to what they've submitted uh, so as to make sure that, um, you know, no one gets insulted, for instance. There's a question from someone in New York who is interested in learning more about the online submissions. Can they get in touch with either of the Sarah's directly about that? Yes, they can. I think our contact information will be in the slides. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Another question is how diverse are the volunteers who are part of the EDLM project? That's a great question. And it's been a, a, a struggle for us. As Pat said a moment ago, the the sort of the natural group that participates in this tends to be educated middle class people who have the time and the inclination to write. Um, and so we, we've been aware of that. We've done a couple things to try and diversify the the group. One is to invite submissions that are not written. So photos, uh, audio or video diaries. We've gotten a few of those things, not not a, not as many as we've gotten diaries, but we have gotten some of that. Uh, and the second thing is, is we've learned to go out to them. Uh, and so we've, we've experimented with other ways of collecting information. So one of the things that Pat and I did, this was shortly before the, the, the shutdown happened. Uh, and so we can't really continue to do this right now, but we hope to resume is we went to um, a community dinner, a kind of soup kitchen dinner at a church. And we distributed questionnaires to participants who were willing to participate. And uh, we, col we collected some, you know, documentation of everyday life from folks who otherwise wouldn't have been involved in the project. And so we continue to look for ways to try and get to the folks who aren't our regular, easy to get participants uh, in all of this. It, it should be said that we don't envision this as a social science project where we're collecting a representative sample of the community. Um, instead, it's more of a sort of a collective art project, a collective writing project. Uh, where anyone who wants to can contribute. Um, but we do want to get as wide a swath of the community as we can. And so we keep trying to find ways to do that. Initially, how much response did you get and how much did you expect initially related to what actually happened? So for Ball State, we got a, uh, a lot of responses at the very beginning when we first promoted it. Um, and then as the spring semester ended, we got a little bit more. So it's, it kind of ebbs and flows. It kind of goes up and goes back down. Um, we do continue to promote it uh, as much as we can through the library social media accounts. And we send out um, info, uh, like email communications to the, the university to try and um, keep it in the, the minds of our um, community members. I'd say it's about the same for um, Muncie Public Library. We found that uh, we were able to get more responses each time that we posted about it in social media, sort of reminding people that the archive exists. Um, so in between those times, it slows down. But then when we have a post about it, that's when we uh, see submissions coming in. We have a captive audience, so we kind of were able to or captive participant group. Uh, so we've been able to sort of sustain that level with some rotation of people in and out uh, through the project. We only have a couple minutes left. So I think we'll uh, ask one more question. To bring this down to a smaller level, could you see this project going forward just through the eyes of school age children? We looked at that for our part of the project and the there's challenges that exist, I think, in bringing kids in to, to, to do this kind of work. Um, we don't consider what we're doing human subject research, but it, it, might, um, it might spill over in that direction. And so we've shied away at this point of collecting information from kids, but it, it's a great idea and an important thing. Uh, and it's definitely something worth doing. I can't advise too much on what the, the sort of pros and cons of, or, or, or the process of engaging kids would be. So our submission form um, requires you to check if you're 18 or over. That was, I think, a requirement by our general counsel's office. So we really haven't looked at the possibility of it um, being through the eyes of school children. I did see someone ask a question about a deed of gift. Um, our deed of gift is replaced by the actual submission form. That's how we, um, we get consent from the donors to be able to add it to the archive and to add it to a digital collection or possibly uh, publishing it down the road. Yeah, we have, a, we have a waiver that all of our volunteers sign as well. 
um, that gives you know that um, gives them intellectual property, uh, but gives us permission to to uh, publish it and um, you know use it for scholarly purposes. Yeah, so we know who they are. I see a final question, um, but we don't publicize their names. We keep everything anonymous online, so nobody using the site is aware of who the diarists are. So the question about um, anonymous is for at least for the Ball State submission forms, that is an option for um, the submitters to check if they wish to remain anonymous. We do still collect their contact information and we get in contact with them to make sure that they meant to check that box because sometimes people just check boxes when they see it before they submit. So we always want to follow up. Um, but um, there's only been a small handful of our um, submissions that have been anonymous. Thank you, everyone. I want to say a huge thank you to Sarah and Sarah, James and Patrick um, for this pe presentation and also my colleagues behind the scenes, Sarah Ostman, Samantha Oakley and Elena Pepe Salutric for their support on this webinar. This presentation has been offered as part of Programming Librarians Free Online Learning with support from the NEH CARES grant. An archived version of this session will be available on Programming Librarian within 48 hours. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. And this last slide shows us ways to contact all of us if you have additional questions. Thank you so much.